Well, good evening. good evening. Lovely to see you. It's a beautiful evening, isn't it? Absolutely yeah. lovely. Don't we, you know, when Alec Passmore comes down here, he always remarks about how beautiful it is around this area. But, I mean, it really is, isn't it? It's just absolutely, absolutely beautiful coming along tonight. We have an amazing God. Amen. Absolutely amazing. Um, the world thinks that it is pretty amazing. <laughs> but it's got nothing, nothing on our creator and our loving God. Psalm 145 says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. In 1 Chronicles, we read, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. And the psalmist said in 139, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my paths, my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and you lay your hand upon me. The Lord's wonderful. There's a new kid on the block today. Did you know that? It's called AI. Anyone not heard of AI? Artificial intelligence. Computers have come a long, long way since I first had my first one back in the 80s. And today, artificial intelligence, that is basically machines that can think for themselves, are taking over. Now, at the present time, this is almost impossible to take in, but I think it's probably true that artificial intelligence can think one 100,000 times as quickly as a human being. Artificial intelligence on the computer can learn a completely new language fluently in just 11 minutes. It is said, and I've looked up in several places on the computer to find out whether this is true, so I hope it is, that Within the next five years, artificial intelligence will have solved and given cures for over 100 incurable, at the present time, diseases and human problems. It seems as though um, AI is going to become rampant and one person I'm sure you've all heard of, Elon Musk, was actually having a tirade with um, Larry Page, one of the originators of Google, because Larry Page wanted to create Google as a, a man-made god. And Elon Musk said, no, you've gone too far. It must always be under control. So impressive, certainly it is. But it's got nothing on the word of God. It's got nothing on the power of God. And it's got nothing on all of God. He is the creator. He is love. He is the forgiver. He is eternal God. Tonight I've got two texts, <laughs> and that's, that's very rare for me to have two texts.
But the Lord spoke to me by one, and then that led me to another. And one of them is mentioned here in the passage that Pat's going to read to us. Philippians chapter 4, starting at verse 1 until 14. Therefore, my beloved and long-for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore Euodia and I implore Synodki to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who laboured with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, Med meditate on these things. The things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. John 14, verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, I've already told you that I've got two texts for tonight. The first one comes from the passage that Pat read to us and it's those lovely words of the Apostles 
Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. And then my other text is found in John 14. That you may be where I am. That you may be where I am. You're probably wondering how those two are connected. Well, I'll try and explain that as well. The first thing is this. that I don't know how you are feeling today, tonight. I've no idea what burdens anyone is carrying. I don't know about your situation in life. Everything might be all hunky-dory and beautiful and wonderful. And you're absolutely itching for tomorrow to be here, full of peace and anticipation and joy in what tomorrow will bring. But I want you to remember this, if nothing else tonight, that when the Apostle Paul wrote those words in Philippians, what we call chapter 4, about rejoicing in the Lord, he was in chains. He was in prison. He didn't know whether the next few days were going to bring him death or release. He didn't know when he would be let free if he was going to be released. And it could be that he might even meet his maker um, in the very next few hours, put to death by that Christian-hating Emperor Nero. And yet he said, Rejoice in the Lord. I say it again. Rejoice. Now, I must tell you this, I haven't heard many messages about joy or rejoicing in the Lord. Perhaps, you see, we just take it for granted. <laughs> Perhaps, on the other hand, it's because we haven't got very much to be joyful about. Or at least we think we haven't. I don't know. But let me first tell you now how I came upon this double text. Um, it's months ago now that I was asked whether I would take a funeral service um, for um, a, a gentleman who had died, who um, came from a non-Christian family. Now, if you'd spoken to them, uh, they would have probably said, oh, yes, we are Christians. But there was absolutely no evidence of that in um, their lives. Uh, they certainly didn't attend any place of worship, as far as I knew, in any of the years that they'd been married. Before the funeral, the widow and one of her sons came to see me to go through the service and they'd already been an intelligent family pretty well got it planned <laughs> what they wanted but I was down in the dumps about it I felt pretty glum oh yes I could preach the gospel but how could I relate it to them in their circumstances I, I'd never like taking the funerals of those who don't know the Lord Jesus I've never liked taking any funeral, really, but you know what I mean. But then the son said, oh, and Mr. Kempston, during the service, could we have the reading from John chapter 14, verses 1 to 6? And suddenly my heart was lifted. <laughs> I said to myself, yes, good, excellent. Now I really have got something to get my teeth into, something that they want and something from which I can preach the gospel at the service, which is, praise God, what happened. Um, I shouldn't perhaps say this to you, but I had an email from someone afterwards, a Christian who was in the congregation that day, who said it was probably the first time they'd ever heard the gospel fully preached at um, a funeral service. Well, that was a real, that was God's thumbs up maybe for what I had shared. Um, his blessing to me, anyway, was extraordinary over that. 
But as I looked at and read through with the son those verses, and we, we read them aloud together, I just couldn't take my mind off those, those words of, I am going there to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, so that you also may be where I am. The very thought just thrilled me. The Lord actually wants me, not just the disciples, but all of us, to be with him in glory in heaven. It's a terrific thought. He actually wants it. Um, you know, Jesus said, God gave his only son that everyone who believes, everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. So it is for me. It is for you. Even if we've got very little knowledge, the dying thief on the cross, well, he only knew three or four things. I don't know how much he'd heard of Jesus before he was put on the cross, but there was the dying thief on the cross. And there's one thing he knew was that Jesus was a king and that Jesus had a kingdom. Second, he knew that Jesus was suffering unfairly because he had said it himself. To the other thief, we are suffering justly for our crimes, but not him, the man in the middle. And then he knew somehow that Jesus was going to rise again from the dead and go to his kingdom. Otherwise, what he said next is nonsense. Because the next thing he said was this. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus' reply was, this day, you will be with me in paradise. Isn't that marvellous? Absolutely marvellous. The more I thought about those words, that he wants us to be with him, it, it really then began to dawn on me. It's, it's so important that we will be with him, of course. Do you remember um, when the disciples came back from their mission, when they went out two by two? And they came back absolutely triumphant, full, full of everything. Why, even the demons are subject to us, they said, he said to Jesus. And Jesus said to them, well, you know the answer already. Rejoice not that the demons are subject to you, but rather... Rejoice in this, that your names are written in heaven. Praise God tonight that if we have accepted Jesus, even with the simplicity of the thief on the cross, we are going to have that inexpressible joy of one day seeing the Lord Jesus face to face and knowing him for eternity. But why is it he loves us so much? And the answer, of course, is that Jesus is human. Yeah, he's a man. Born a real baby. Grew up in a family. Went out and preached as a man. And people flocked from Syria and from the right north coast of the Mediterranean Sea to hear this man speak. He grew tired. He wanted to sleep and did so even in the storm. He loved. Even just once there's an almost a touch of exasperation when he comes down from the mountain and says to his um, disciples, um, you know, how much longer have I got to be with you? You can just hear someone saying that today, oh, you lot, you know. <laughs> How much longer have I got to endure you? But of course the Lord will hold on to us forever because he loves us, because he made us. 
and he is too human. Of course, that word in John 14 isn't the first time he's said this. When he chose his disciples and um, first brought them together in Mark's Gospel, chapter 3, he again says that he appointed the 12. Now, not first of all, not that they might become great missionaries, but he appointed the 12 that they might be with him. Isn't that great? You see, being human, he wanted human company. He wanted human backup. He wanted human intercourse with other people. And he still does, of course, with you and me. Are we worthy of this great intercourse with Christ? No, of course we're not. It's a unique relationship with every believer. He sets by his love for us an eternal value on us. He safeguards us, even in our weaknesses. He restores us after our failures. It, he helps us to overcome sin by his presence. We become more like him as we learn about him in his company. He helps us to be removed from our fears in this world and about life and even about death. And he is able to give us a companionship. He loves bringing the children to him, the babies to him. And he told his disciples not to send them away. But he also loved the elderly for every age from the very birth to the grave. He loves us and he wants to be with us right now. His companionship is there for each of us. Go away with that tonight. He wants us. He wants you to be with him. Now in this life and also later. Now what do I want to say about this relationship? The first thing and the thing that's been on my mind is, is that other text from Philippians. It must be, it should be, hopefully it will be, a relationship of joy. It, the disciples did have Jesus with them for a few years before he went away. But you and I have never had Jesus. Not, not once have we actually seen him physically. But before he went away in that great high priestly prayer of his, he said, I am saying these things now while I am here in the world so that they might have the full measure of my joy in them. John 17, 13. He was going, but he wanted his joy, the full measure of his joy, to be in us. Now, what really is joy? Peace and joy go together. They're like the inside and the outside of a glove. But peace is almost, if not always, dependent on our circumstances. Joy is something that we can have irrespective of our circumstances. Completely irrespective of our circumstances. It's something that is, humanly speaking, inexplainable. How is it that Peter, the night before he was going to be taken out, tried and executed, could be sound asleep? How is it that the Apostle Paul and Silas could be in prison, having been beaten wickedly, and there at midnight, in the darkness of the cell, joyfully praising God and singing hymns. 
It's, it's inexplicable, humanly speaking. It's something that God gives us. Now, I remind you again that when Paul wrote that little letter of Philippians, in just four short chapters, he mentions joy at least 15 times. It's, it's, it is the New Testament letter of joy. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter. 1 Peter, chapter 1. And verse 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith is shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come to you so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. It's a joyful relationship then, despite the circumstances. A joyful relationship... Do you mind if I just mention my dear wife, Janet, for a moment? Don't think you need to take notes about it, Pat. <laughs> I dearly love my wife. And we were married for over 54 years. We loved each other's company. If I had to go out somewhere without Janet, or where Janet was not, it was sometimes as if the room was almost empty. So important was Janet to me. <clears throat> we were so close, I've told you before this, that we could even think alike. We could be thinking the same thoughts, almost exactly the same thoughts. We've even been out to different towns and come back with exactly the same roll of wallpaper. <laughs> A rather expensive um, wallpaper, I might add, which normally Janet wouldn't indulge in. <laughs> but there we are. That is such a lovely, such a wonderful relationship to have. I still love her. I love her voice. I love her perceptions of things. And, of course, at every step, Janet shared my faith. She also was a lovely lovely Christian. Well, what is our relationship like with Jesus? Can I ask you that? Uh, um, am I being rude? Is yours a joyful relationship with Christ? I mean that, whatever the circumstances. One of the possibly least read books of the Bible is the Song of Songs. And then it's a love story between a, a king and his bride. And, you know, at one point after dark, she suddenly realises that he's not there beside her. He's not even at the door. And so she gets up and she goes out in the dark and walks through the streets. She goes through the squares of the city, down the lanes, but she doesn't find him. And then she comes across the watchmen who are still on duty. Have they seen her beloved? No. And then she's hardly gone on from them, and suddenly, and I'm reading now verse 4 of chapter 3, scarcely had I passed them 
When I found the one my heart loves, I held him and I wouldn't let him go. And then chapter four lays open his love also for her. That little book is always about the love of Christ for the church and the church's love back for him. It's real joy we want in Christ. In the book of Revelation, the one thing it seems that Jesus detested to see amongst Christians is lukewarmness, half-heartedness. He didn't want us to be up and running Christians one day and then sort of running on only two cylinders the next. We may be, but we still need to have that joy in the relationship. It may be overdoing it a bit, but do you remember that story about King David when he was bringing the ark up to Jerusalem? <laughs> His wife was looking out the window and she saw him dancing at the head of the procession. And she despised him because of it. And he says, I was dancing before the Lord who chose me above your father and his family and who appointed me as the leader of Israel, the people of the Lord. So I am willing to act like a fool in order to show my joy in the Lord. Well, we're very reserved, we British, but I do wonder how long ago it was that you last shouted in joy at the Lord God or with the Lord God. Why, well, do you know, and I've said this before, we can scarcely get an amen out of people today. What a sh great shame. What a great shame. If a prayer is said, you agree with it, yell out amen at the end. Encourage the other prayers. Encourage the prayer. Don't just sit there silent, talking down to your own chest. Praise the Lord and be open about it and open about your faith. In Psalm 32, David said, Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for him. <laughs> Jeremiah, um, sorry, Nehemiah looked upon it in a completely different way, didn't he? He said, The joy of the Lord is my strength. If he loses his joy in Christ, then his life began to go into tatters. This joy in the Lord is so important. Romans 12, be joyful, said Paul, in your hope. Well, we really do have so much to be joyful about. Yes, well, to be honest, I'm sharing this with my family. I've had a real beating over the last six months. A real beating. Not only, I'm not, not just talking about my hernia operation, although that wasn't very pleasant in the months leading up to it. It had been nagging away at a long time. It had been destroying my health in lots of ways, pulling me down and pulling me down. I'm still under the doctor for other things at the present moment. But do you know, I've been so surprised that the one thing that has kept me going and on the right way is joy in the Lord. That's why that text is just so important. His presence, to be ready to meet him, if that's what he desires, to be ready to go and leave this world, one's family and loved ones. We've got to have our joy in the Lord, haven't we? It's so important. This joyful relationship, I may not be presenting tonight's talk in lots of points, I'm sorry about that, but this joyful relationship should be trusting. It should be deepening day by day. And it will result in fruitfulness, which will otherwise not be there, but which will bring glory to his name. 
Now, we all know that real friendship, real friendship, is based on trust. And, you know, most of us haven't got someone that we can fully trust. I hope that husbands and wives can fully trust each other. Somebody's got no one they can trust. No friend that they can fully trust with everything. I want somebody who can, I can speak to who might know the very worst in me, but still says, I'm not going to let you go. No one will have the power to drag you out of my hand. <coughs> That's the relationship we need, a trusting, a trusting relationship, and a deepening one as well. I love that text in Ephesians, um, chapter 1, and in 17 and 18, where the Apostle Paul says this, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you might know him better. The Lord loves us that much. He wants to, us to know him better. And hence why I read in Peter that all the discouragement of those trials and fears and things that we have, they're in order that we might know him better and our faith will be purified. Oh, how wonderful that is. A deepening relationship and friendship based on a mutual trust that is ever and ever growing. I will give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one, I repeat, no one can snatch them or grab them out of my hand. Did you notice in the text, in Philippians 4, how the Apostle Paul put it? Rejoice in the Lord. Next word. Come on, somebody. Rejoice, I say. Rejoice in the Lord. Always. Thank you. Come on, let's hear you loud. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. The Apostle Paul knew that Christians were going to suffer. He had suffered probably more than any of them and would do by the end of his life. Always rejoice in the Lord, not just on the good days, but on all the days. I love Habakkuk. Do you know that those verses in Habakkuk? In the, in the, the last chapter, Habakkuk chapter 3, where he says this when he knows that God has just said that his nation is going to be invaded by a foreign power, it's going to be taken over, and it's going to be totally destroyed. The people are going to be carried away. And he said this to God, though the fig tree does not bud, and though there are no grapes on the vines, and though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, and though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour, the Sovereign Lord. He is my strength. Well, I don't know how much some of you have suffered a lot. I know some of you have suffered awfully, more than I can say. But I hope that today as you sit here with me, that you've got the joy of the Lord in your heart. God is faithful, said the Apostle to the Corinthian people. And he'll never let you be tempted beyond your ability, but will, with the temptation, also provide a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. I think that at least Peter knows that um, Andrea and I have a dog called Seeker. It means deer, by the way. Um, in Indian, 
and all deer out in India and that part of the world are called seekers. And she's, she's a darling. She really is. But she's got one deplorable habit. She lies down in the most dangerous places you could imagine. I mean, in the doorway of the kitchen or the back door or all three doors in our place where they all three meet together and you're using 50 times a day or halfway up the stairs. They'll suddenly be walking up and there's ah, and your knee will come up and you're almost trodden on the dog. <laughs> you know, Seeker doesn't even twitch. <laughs> well, if she does, it's probably the end of a tail. It just goes wag, wag, wag. You know why, of course? You know that she knows that we would never, never intend to hurt her. It would never be our intention to tread on her. She knows that we love her. And she shows it sometimes by licking our faces. I only need to shave once every three days because of the way the dog licks me. She just loves us. And we love her. Oh, praise God that we can have that not the licking part, maybe, but have that trust and joy in the Lord Jesus tonight. And remember that it's never his intention to hurt us or to harm us in any, in any way at all. Peter was going to fail Jesus. But Jesus prayed for him and he said, Peter, I prayed for you that your faith will not fail, will not fail. Well, you may not think that this is particularly to do with joy, but I don't think there's very few passages in the, in the whole of the Bible, like Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me he restores my soul. He guides me. And even through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. For he is with me. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm coming to the end for tonight. You all know Hazel Feast. Well, most of you do anyway. Um, I got on very well with Peter, her husband. And one day, Peter, who um, uh, had an aeroplane, took me flying with him from Denham. And we were going to fly to the Isle of Wight. And uh, we got over the South Downs. And over the South Downs, suddenly, a mist came up. And the mist turned to fog. And poor Peter couldn't see to pilot our way. Now, it was a fairly simple aeroplane. You understand that, a small Cessna, not a Boeing. <laughs> and I'd got my earphones on in, in the back seat. And um, suddenly over the earphones came and said, Barry, I'm so sorry. I don't think we're going to make it to the Isle of Wight. Um, with a little plane like this, over the downs, I can't be 100% certain of my altitude. I'm afraid that we'll have to turn back because the real important thing is not that we see the Isle of Wight, but that we get back to Denham and land safely at home. Uh, brothers and sisters, that's exactly what the Lord is saying to us. There may be the mists, there may be the fog, there may be the dense fog, there may be all the hurt, but he knows exactly what we're going to go through. And his intention is that bearing much fruit to his glory through this wonderful, joyful relationship, he will see us home. <laughs>